In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, for they have heard the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord that great is the glory of the Lord. Words from Psalm 138, the choir sang just a few moments ago, which echo the vision of Isaiah who glimpsed the glory of the Lord in the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord in the temple, sitting on a throne, high and lofty. Isaiah saw the seraphs who wait upon God. In the Christian tradition, seraphs are the highest order of angels because they attend the Lord continually, proclaiming his glory and are very close to his presence. From the teaching of the early church fathers to the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, seraphs have been associated with light, heat, and fire, which Aquinas describes as penetrating all things, bringing, cleansing. Aquinas also interpreted their continual movement after all, they have six wings as a sign that we should be drawn closer and closer to the Lord, just as fire is continually moving upwards. The seraphs also have a particular song, known in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom as the Trisagion, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That same song will be heard again in this Mass when the choir sings the Sanctus, joining their voices with the voices of angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, that is, with the seraphs. And note that when the seraphs sing the Trisagion, the temple shook at its very foundations, and the temple was filled with smoke, with incense. It is a remarkable vision, and as St. Ignatius Loyola would encourage us, we should let our imaginations run away with it. What is the response of Isaiah to this amazing sight? Isaiah said, woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The natural response to seeing the glory of the Lord is to feel unclean and unworthy, recognizing that one is a sinner. Significantly, it was one of those seraphs, one of the fiery creatures close to God that mediates and cleansed Isaiah of his sinful state. Only then could Isaiah answer God's question. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Isaiah replied immediately, here am I. Send me. If we turn to the gospel reading today, we will discover parallels with our Old Testament lesson. Jesus had had such a crowd around him that it was becoming impossible to see them all. Perhaps he was even being pushed off the shore and into the lake itself. So very practically, Jesus got into a boat, Simon Peter's boat, and asked him to pull away from the shore a little so that he could address the crowd. He did so sitting in the boat, a sign of his authority as a teacher to be seated, which incidentally is also why bishops have traditionally preached from their cathedra or chair from the earliest days of the church. There is a beautiful painting of this scene 
unfinished by the great vision, British visionary painter Stanley Spencer, begun almost 10 years before his death in 1959. It is a huge painting, I've seen it. Seven feet tall and 18 feet wide, titled Christ Preaching at Cookham Regatta. It was intended to have lots of paintings around it. Now, Cookham is a village on the River Thames in Berkshire where Stanley Spencer was born and which featured in many of his paintings. The paintings and the panels that were painted to accompany it reveal the class structure of Edwardian times with the wealthy visitors hiring punts for the day and feasting, something locals, including Stanley Spencer when he was young, could not afford to do. Significantly, Jesus does not sit in a punt on the River Thames. He sits in the horse ferry barge, a great big thing used to carry people across the River Thames before the road bridge was built. At the heart of the painting, Jesus, wearing a wonderful straw boater and sitting in a rattan chair with his disciples, is leaning forward in sharp contrast to the shenanigans going on in the punts around him. There is an intensity in this movement of Jesus towards the crowd, connecting with them, challenging them. He is staring at them when many of them, in their finery, ignore him, except, of course, for the children. In the Gospel account, after he had finished teaching, Jesus asked Simon Peter to take the boat away from the shallows into the deep to go fishing. Now, you can imagine his frustration. They had had a miserable night's fishing, and they had caught nothing, which presumably means that Simon and his colleagues were pretty much exhausted. Furthermore, they had been washing the nets, when, oh no, Jesus appears with a crowd. I guess they just probably wanted to go home. Nevertheless, Simon half-heartedly agrees to go into the deep. And the catch was so great that the nets began to break, and James and John had to come to Simon's aid. But then the catch of fish starts to make both boats sink. What is Simon's response to all of this? He fell to his knees and cried out, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Sound familiar? Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, said Isaiah when he saw the glory of the Lord. And just as Isaiah received cleansing, so did Simon Peter. Except that this time, there was no need of an intermediary, no seraph or angelic spirit. For we read that Jesus said to Peter, do not be afraid. Jesus himself, the perfect image of the invisible God, reveals God's glory in his very self and makes Simon Peter whole again. The natural response to glimpsing the presence of God is fear, awe, and a sense of unworthiness and sinfulness. Yet in the case of Isaiah and Peter, God saw past their sin and unworthiness and called them into a new relationship, giving them a mission to perform. Whom shall I send, said God? Who will go for us? Isaiah replied, here am I, send me. Jesus said to Peter, from now on, you will be catching people. Our epistle reading also has parallels with this theme of unworthiness preceding the divine call. Paul is reflecting on the response of the apostles to the resurrection and the importance of handing on the story, proclaiming the gospel. 
But how does Paul describe meeting the Lord? Last of all, he says, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Yet again, Jesus looked beyond Paul's failings and weaknesses. In fact, he called Paul with his failings and weaknesses, just like he called Peter and so many others, just as he called James and John, yes, even Judas Iscariot, who later on betrayed him. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. I am what I am. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, freely given in order to invigorate and restore. Note the pattern. Acknowledging one's unworthiness results in God's call. As St. Therese used to say, God does not call the people worthy of the calling. No. He chooses the people it pleases him to call. I am what I am. That is why every liturgy, even the coronation liturgy of Queen Elizabeth II, includes confession and absolution, a stripping away of status. Remember that scene when all the pomp was taken off and for a moment in quiet she sat with just a white shift? Ironically, it is in acknowledging our own unworthiness that we are able to hear and truly answer God's call. He doesn't want us to come to him perfect. He makes us perfect. We just come as we are. My friends, as we draw near to Holy Communion today, we shall repeat the words of the centurion who met Jesus when he pleaded with him to heal his servant. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Our response to the singing of the Trasagion, holy, holy, holy. Our response to the real presence of Jesus in the sacrament of his body and blood is naturally one of unworthiness, just like Isaiah, just like Peter, just like the centurion. But the response of Jesus is to call us into a deeper relationship with him, if you like, to put out into the deep water, as it were, to respond to his call. Jesus looks at you and me in exactly the same way and says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Dare we, like them, respond, here am I, send me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.